I am <coughs> one of the many people that make up this bird publishing. Um, everyone who has anything to do with Busy Bird is either a writer or an editor or an artist poet of, of some kind. And we have quite a few of our team here tonight, which is fantastic. We have some new faces tonight, which is also great. Um, and tonight is our 21st birthday. <laughs> We actually have a 21st birthday cake up the front, up the back there. So this is our 21st open mic night. It's a bit exciting. We're, we're, we're legal now. So that's exciting. I won't go any further with that. Um, so the first thing we're going to do tonight is we're going to launch Bill Wakeling's book. And here it is. called The uh, Gremlin Connection. I met Bill maybe three or four years ago now when he had his first book out uh, when I was working at the library. So it's quite a, a way back. I don't know how you found me again when I came here. Did you follow me? I'm going to get Bill up here in a minute. We're going to give him a bit longer than everyone else. But everyone who has their name on the list, I don't necessarily go in the order. It depends on whether it, what sort of piece you have. But can we keep it to roughly five minutes, please? Uh, Les is going to be timer up the back, so he's going to actually ding a bell at five minutes. Doesn't mean you have to stop talking straight away. <laughs> um, you, know, you can finish a sentence or, or whatever, but um, it just means that everyone sort of has. Um, who's giggling up the back? I can't see anybody, but someone's giggling. I think because it's their 21st, someone's had a bit too much fear. <laughs> Maybe? Uh, um, she's still doing it. <laughs> so, um, yes, we're, five minutes please. We're going to give um, Bill a 15-ish minutes, um, unless we boo him off the stage. No, That's quite possible. <laughs> quite possible. So, um, welcome Bill Wakely. Two best things that ever happened in my life. First was when I met my lady. And second was when I met Blaze. <laughs> Gotta tell you. Well, I'm gonna start with um, a trip I had up to the North Coast about three weeks ago. Sorry? <laughs> oh, good. I had a trip up north to the North Coast about three weeks ago and I, I had a bit of time with my brother and uh, he's now put together about three three books, two novels and a collection of short stories. Now, my brother's always worked on the basis that I can get it for you wholesale. Whatever you do, you got, I can always do it cheaper. And he'd say to me, why do you go with that publisher? I have got an organisation that will publish it, they'll print your book for half the price. And I always just smile sweetly and I let him go. So I was up in the North Coast and I had, had dinner with him about three weeks ago, as I said. And he'd asked me what I'd been doing and I told him that I that day been to Bellingham Library and in turn I'd been then um, referred to the Grafton Region Library. And, I'm going to uh, see. So, um, he, he thought that was interesting. He, he said, well, why, would you, why would you use the libraries? He says, there's no money in working with libraries. <laughs> and uh, bear in mind, you know, he's self-published himself and he's used this organisation to print the books and he hasn't had a lot of marketing experience or help or expertise. But he asked me, he said, well, why use the money? I've got a blind spot. He, he did an essay. Thesis. We'll call it that. Thesis. Thank you. Thank you. Well Kevin, thank you so much. <laughs> Would that, you take my photograph at some stage? Now, Kevin, thank you. He, he did a thesis on a thing called Bletchley Park. We talked about that just before, Bletchley Park, which was where they uncovered the Enigma machine in the Second World War, and that's where they decoded all these German mysteries. Well, anyway, Harry got interested in this, and he followed it right through the, 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 the Cold War, and, and, and so it was only natural that when he joined ASIO that he would be a cryptographer. Now, in the second novel, he is the star of the show, because in the second novel, it's all about 
The storyline is all about unmasking a mole in the Australian Parliament. Either the Prime Minister, called Jennifer Gardner, the Titian-haired socialist left Prime Minister, <laughs> Jennifer Gardner, or her liberal nemesis, the fitness fanatic bike riding Terry Arnold. <laughs> One of them is a Russian spy. And the whole purpose of the book is to find out who it is. Now it's a bit like Mousetrap. If you work it out, don't tell anybody. <laughs> All right? So, that's the basic story that we've got. But you see, apart from that, we're bringing a lot of things into the story. We're bringing the business about Harold Holt. Now there may be people who don't know anything about Harold Holt. Do you, do you, do you, does that ring a bell with you? It certainly does. It certainly does. It should with you, but some of these younger people may not. Harold Holt was a Prime Minister. And one day at ship. Now I want to just segue for a moment because yesterday I was talking to a fellow in Queensland who's a book publisher. Anyway, I sent him the email that told him all about the story in front and back covers. And he sent back things saying, look, we'll take 10 copies, thanks very much, and we'll, take, we'll send them off to the libraries. And says, I'll buy it. But he said, I'm personally interested because I want to read the book because I want to find out what you've got to say about Harold Holt. I said, fine, why is it a matter of interest? He said, because he happened to be my grandfather. <laughs> oh, isn't that amazing? <laughs> now, if I can read my horror clippings. Aha! There's more to the story than this. There's lots of pots within pots. We've got an Israeli colonel who's got terminal cancer. He's only got a couple of months to live. And he's been prevailed upon to sell the new page turn. I'll leave it to others to decide. I hope you like it if you read it. It should hold your attention. But I want to say none of this would have been possible without the help and the support of the people who helped put this together. Up the back we've got a guy called Les Zigomanis. He calls himself Les Zig, I wonder why. <laughs> and Les is the guy who did the editing. I would have been lost with that, Les. Absolutely lost. This lady, who gives you help with the construction of the whole thing, how you put it together, how you approach it, this is good, that's not so good, suggest you use this technique, don't use that technique, that's all very important. And the guy that they use from time to time, called Luke Harris, who's a graphic designer, but then again, they could have done that here too. Les, um, uh, uh, Luke Harris designed that. And when all is said and done, if you want to, you know, it, it, it's all appeal, isn't it? That's what's going to sell it at the bookstore. And I think they did a great job, don't you? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I can't thank Blaze enough. If you're ever going to publish a novel, if you've ever given any consideration, or will give consideration to publish a novel, come and talk to Blaze. You know, she's, she's not Penguin. She's not uh, some of the big publishers around, but she's good at what she does. I hope you read the book, I hope you'll enjoy it, and I'll be happy to sign it for you. Ways, thank you so much. if anyone wants to purchase it and get it signed by the author tonight. Absolutely. That would be great. Um, thanks, Bill. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you. Um, and it's, it's, oh, it's so good to see it all come together. But all your hair's falling out. <laughs> it's, it's, it's grown a bit. <laughs> it's grown really <laughs> okay. So, just I, I forgot to mention before that Kev is videoing this. Um, I, I use on YouTube. So if anyone here does not want to be on YouTube, please let us know. Um, we just do it automatically if you, you know, sort of in the, by the end of the week or so. Um, it's really good if you're up here speaking to have a look at yourself and, you know, see how you're going, how, you know, what your writing's like and what your style is like actually being up in front of people. So... Did some, someone came in before? Whoever did, do they want to read? David. David? Did you want to read tonight? Or no, you just... no, I'm, I'm a, a bit of, of uh, something, so I can't. So. Okay, that's yes. cool. Welcome back anyway. Look, what have you done to yourself? 
And I had a hip replacement. So oh, well done. Yeah. <laughs> well done. And you came up our driveway? Yes. Okay. <laughs> we might need to carry you back down. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with Richard with a short story. Welcome, Richard. So everyone now has roughly five minutes, and these will be in Some unlucky bugger has got to follow Bill, and it's why <laughs> not. I should put my name down second, third, or fourth. Um, what a great book, uh, Bill, but what a great presentation. Christ, you got the job. Anyway, I'm going to tell you my little tale about Anzac Day, my first Anzac Day, because it is coming up to them. When I was 20, uh, first time I came to Australia, I ended up uh, working with stud cattle. Then after about a year, I got a job on the Stock and Station Journal in Adelaide, an agricultural paper, only a small office, great people. And that was how I was introduced to my first Anzacs and my first Anzac day. And this is my tale. Baz said to meet in the pub just down the road from the newspaper office. A beer or two, he said, the Grenadier. Maybe three, said Jason with a wry grin. Maybe three? I knew Anzac Day was regarded as a national holiday throughout Australia. Not just a day off, not just a day down the beach, a barbie in the backyard. I'd been told what to expect long before I made Australia my home. But I hadn't expected this. The law is hot on drink driving, Baz warned. If you don't want your collar felt, I'll take the train. I am. I did and he did the warning. The 9.35 into Adelaide station was packed. So many Aussies wanted to share the day. Share it with the brave men like Bats and Jason, who volunteered and flown Spitfires and Hurricanes and helped rout the Japanese in the islands. Then I joined the crowds lining the route, King William Street, 10 and 12 deep, watching the march. The band resplendent played. The crowd cheered, Aussie flags waved. I caught a glimpse of Baz with their handlebar moustache and Jason with the tiny tash. There they were, striding out, so smart, so focused, such determination written on their faces for the day, their day. Brave bastards, muttered the man to my right, brave bastards came through hell. I turned and nodded to him, I shared his thought. And then they passed, so proud, and I was proud to know them. Baz and Jason, proud to work alongside them on the paper. Baz the sub-editor, Jason the senior writer. Proud for what they had done for their country, our country, our freedom. Brace bastards, all of them, he said again, as the last man trailed off down King William Street and out of sight. And the sound of the band trailed off too. Up through the door and the pub's heaving, the men are there already, straight off the march, still smart and pristine, their uniforms still blinking in the light of day for the first time in 12 months, spruced up, freshly ironed for the occasion, their wives had seen to that, digger hats brushed, shirts ironed and jackets fist to. Did Baz say, maybe? And Jason, perhaps? You can scarcely hear in the bar, there's room at the back, it's quieter, says Jason. He points, ruddy cheeks, the tiny tash. He's quieter there. He has to shout to make himself heard, though. Table, chairs, an nice pedestrian in the corner, men sitting, leaning over, talking together, sharing jokes. Yet it's quieter in here, although it's still packed. I find myself standing over a table with a group of three soldiers in uniform of the First World War, chatting to, about what they went through reminiscing, telling their experiences, the details, the days, the nights, their comrades, the dead, yes, the dead, the men they left behind on the battlefield, good Aussie men. Did I hear a bell then? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very appropriate story for um, anniversary. That's one another night I can finish it. Yes. <laughs> and um, very um, 
uh, interesting, I don't know if anyone saw all the discussions today about the, the Woolworths ads for the NZ. Yes. Someone's going to be in trouble. A um, bit of a change of pace now, Melissa. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Chapter 4 from Under the Big Top. Continuation from last time. Yes. I don't think there's any gore in this one, so apologies again for last month. Um, so this is uh, the continuation from last month of the children's horror story. Uh, so at this point, Janet and her twin brother Paul and their mum have just made it to the circus. As they got closer to the tent, Janet saw a statue in front of the main entrance. She quickened her steps to catch up with Mum and Paul. Paul nudged her shoulder. See that? He said, pointing to the statue as they got closer. Janet nodded. Her head still throbbed and she briefly rubbed the side of one temple. The three of them stopped, looking at the figure on the tiny platform before them. It was an old woman holding what looked like a bag of fairy floss. Janet quickly realised it was the small dog from the poster she'd seen at the bus stop only days ago. It was the hot pink poodle. It was snarling like in the photo. Instead, sorry, it wasn't snarling like in the photo. Instead, it sat patiently in the woman's arms. Sorry, she said, looking at her children amused. We thought you were a statue. I hope we didn't offend you. As if a secret command had been given, the pink poodle came to life, barked and sneered, bearing yellow stained teeth to all of them. The old woman held it in a vice-like grip as the pink fluffy rats squirmed and wriggled, desperate to launch out of her arms and attack the new arrivals. Janet gulped as its beady black eyes zoned in on her. She moved closer to Mum, with Paul right behind her. Mum smiled. Are we the first to arrive? She asked, trying to shrug the kids off. You are the last to arrive, actually, the old woman replied, her face still void of emotion. As the show is just about to start, you can hand your tickets in upon leaving. Is it just the three of you? She asked, looking at them, her tone slightly softer. Yes, just us three, Mum replied, her smile still plastered onto her face. My husband was meant to come, but he had work, and... Janet looked at her mother. Why was she blubbering about Dad? Janet wished her father was there. He would have taken one look at this scary old crone and her feral dog and declared it seen enough. There was an awkward silence between the four of them. You may proceed inside, the woman said, impatience now in her voice, just wait in the foyer. Hunter will take you to your seats. Thank you, Mum said, walking towards the black curtain, unfazed by the woman and whatever could be on the other side of the material. Janet leaned in towards Paul. Still want to be here, she whispered, her voice the least of authority, but held a measure of panic. Paul looked at his sister and nodded, his chin jutting forward. I still want to see what this is all about, he whispered back. Janet sighed. As they approached the curtain, it opened automatically, revealing a black, white and red interior of the small foyer. Cool, Paul said, smiling. Janet hesitated as Mum and Paul confidently walked in. She looked back to look at the old woman and her dog. They weren't there. Come on, Janet, Paul said. This is awesome. Janet carefully walked under the curtain, crossing the threshold. Once she was inside, the curtain dropped quickly behind her. Mm, I'm in now. From inside the foyer, almost, uh, the inside of the foyer almost mirrored the outside of the tent itself. The walls were striped black and red, posters lined some of the wall space. Red lighting flooded the tiny room, making Janet feel like she was covered in blood. Opposite her was another black curtain, hanging above a come in sign. To her left was a small glass counter. An old cash register sat on the right side of the glass. Janet bent down and looked at the merchandise lying on the shelves beneath the counter. Tiny figures were lit up by small white lights. There was a figure of a poodle and the old woman. Next to these were statues of tiny red and black cars and a spinning wheel. Must be the clown car or something. Look at... <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Oh, yes, he does. Okay. Oh, 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 o
started, this event has been around a long time, but we started publishing, um, we had one item and that was um, Untitled. Now, Untitled actually came about because of Les. It's totally his fault. <laughs> um, so this is an anthology that we produce once a year of, full of short stories. So this is one of our own titles that we actually publish. So this is a traditional publishing um, item, product, product if you like. Um, and anyone who knows anything about Busy Bird knows that Les is our publications manager and he is actually the best uh, structural editor in the country, I think. Um, but I just wanted to share some news. Les is going to kill me. He is now. He might be a fantastic editor, but he's an even better writer and he has lots of novels that are ready to go out into the world. And this, well, last week, he actually was signed up with Sally Bird Literary Agent. Literary agent. So, sorry? It's called Calgary Sally Bird. Sally Bird. So, um, I want to say congratulations. <laughs> Excuse me, is he going to say a word or two? I'm going. He's going to be dropping with me anyway for bringing him up here. What did you say? Opportunity. Well, I was up there, I could have said a few words. Yeah, why did you? He's saying words now. I was walking away. So, if anyone knows anything about publishing in Australia, it's really hard compared to a lot of countries because of our population more than anything. And only about 3% of stuff that gets submitted to publishers actually gets published in the traditional sphere. That's why a lot of people are turning to self-publishing these days because there's a lot of fantastic work that doesn't see the light of day. But to get a um, literary agent is actually amazing as well because there's not many of them. So I want to say congratulations again. <laughs> gotten a little ticket when you came in tonight. So the door prize is actually going to be a copy of Untitled and a t-shirt. So keep your ticket handy for when they come up. Did you pay pay to come in? Oh hell no. <laughs> 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 so yeah. yeah. <laughs> Melissa will give you a ticket. Um, we need pay. <laughs> <laughs> well we'll take A on you. Um Siobhan, would you like to come up to the front please? Siobhan is going to read a non-fiction piece called My Greatest Fear. And not all the t-shirt you could be wearing. Oh, right. oh, wow. So does anybody want my ticket? Because I don't actually need it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think I already have that one. I'll have the ticket. Yes, it's nice. You'll buy the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, this is something I wrote while discussing death with my family, so yeah. Apologies to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so yeah. Uh, my greatest fear in life is that I'll die with a regret. Just one. Just one would be enough to have me forever more haunt the world of the living. Just one will have enough power to keep my soul forever floating in limbo, unable to see my family, unable to walk the afterlife with my family and friends I so dearly miss. Unable to return to the ones I love walking the path to death. They'll meet me eventually. They'll meet me when it's their time. But not if I'm bound here while they move past me and I'm forever lost here, circling the world of the living. I fear that when I die, I won't have done everything. Is death the finish line of life? Is it like a relay where... <coughs> Sorry. Is it like a relay where we pass buttons? Do we need a bucket list to justify our choices? Do we need it because why else would we go to Paris or bungee jump or fall in love or have kids? Do we have a bucket list because it's something to hope for? Why are we so obsessed with death that we actually forget to live? Why do we live each day with the threat of death looming over our heads? Why do we plan for next month when next month may not exist? Why does the world forget Carpe Diem? For that matter, why does the world ignore the rest of the quote? Seize the day, trusting as little as possible on the next day. This is telling us to, not to trust tomorrow, but no one remembers this when saying carpe diem, like it's meant to mean something other than life will screw you over, don't let it. Why does the world lay all their hopes on life and humanity and longevity and living, 
why place our trust in today and tomorrow and Thursday and October, when now, then and later may not exist? Why waste the opportunity of now? Why save money and not go on that trip? See that movie, meet that actor, buy that car, shirt, TV. The world lives in fear of death, and yet that is the only thing in this world that we are certain of. That one day, to paraphrase the late great Robin Williams, we will all be Remy. One day we will leave this earth and our body will be ignored. I say I visit Faulkner Cemetery often, but the truth is, I feel little, well, no connection to patches of grass that have name tags assigned to them. Sometimes there's a rose tree or a twig. Sometimes, if I'm lucky, someone else has placed flowers and I'm not the person who forgot. Really, just the person who doesn't see the point in spending $30 on flowers that caretakers will throw away at the end of the week. My grandmother was a frugal old soul. If she knew I had wasted that money, she would kill me. Though, if she knew that I'd go to a patch of dirt or grass during summer to talk to her, she'd have me sent somewhere with nice pale walls and nice common voices where I could be restrained during the day. And then she would disappear because she's not real. I've spoken about a book that we're working on at the moment, um, which is the autobiography of Joffa. Does anyone know who Joffa is? Yeah. yeah? So Joffa is the head of the um, Love Him or Hate Him. Some people think he's the Bogan, but if you actually get to know Joffa, he's a pretty amazing guy. He's actually the, the head of the cheer squad of Collingwood. Now, I'm not a football person myself, but there's a kid who have arguments about football. Lost. And I half listen. <laughs> you lost, didn't you? So, <laughs> Kevin, uh, I won the bet. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we're doing the biography, or Joffa's doing his biography, and we're going to be publishing it in a couple of months. And we're very excited to have Father Bob Maguire to launch it. So this will be in June. Um, so the book is very close to being ready for um, production. It's almost finished with the editing. Um, so, sort of watch this space about that because we're quite excited about that project. Um, and um, some of the proceeds from the book will go to epilepsy because Joffa's daughter had epilepsy. Uh, okay, we've got a newbie tonight called Angus. Angus is going to read a short story and um, it's great to have you. Welcome. <laughs> Hey guys, so I'm Angus Watson. Um, I don't have much of a backstory, but a friend of mine once went through a really hard time and I thought I'd put it to words and this is how he explained it to me. It's called The Forest. It used to be the same as others. You once thought and felt the same as others. You once dreamt and believed the same as others. You were once alive, but not now. Now, you live in the forest, all by yourself. In this forest, one loses a sense of time and purpose. Here, the mind becomes separated from the soul. Naturally, some would be euphoric to possess an entire forest to themselves and use such as a retreat from the world. But this is no ordinary forest. It is cruel and unforgiving in every sense. The sky above has, not, has always been as black as coal and exists absent hope of light. The clouds that are it cannot be seen, but the perpetual rain which falls from them is keenly felt. The countless trees and their piercing branches forming the forest would make any normal person feel intimidated, but after all the time you've spent here, you've grown numb to the pain. The rough ground beneath your feet is compiled of fallen limbs, sand and mud. Every step you take with your bare feet swells with shame and remorse. Some would be euphoric to possess an entire forest without any aid. You cannot stay here. There is no help. What can you do? Nearby stones scramble in fear, incapable of retreat. With this decision, you feel something's building up, like droplets of water eventually forming a cascading flood. But in this forest, there is no flood, only the beast. The creatures born of a fever dream, with incredible height and colossal horns, frightening trees to fell themselves. The beast's strength and speed outmatches that of any man. With each moment that passes by in this forest, with every step and every breath, the beast edges closer, with inevitable confrontation. Malevolent and corrupting, it is something to be greatly feared. Pools of foul water lash out from restricted from dirt to dirt. You cannot stay in this forest. Futility is thick in the air, pain is mandatory, and the beast constantly hunts you. You point it to yourself. What can I do? You could run. Run, the, run, run with it. Run from the beast and escape its grasp. 
but realistically, how long would that last? You could continue your way of life and give in, allow temptation and torment to defeat you and embrace its talons. You would be surrendering all you've ever known and any possibility of a future. Everything would be over. Or, you could fight. You smirk slightly to yourself. The word sounds foreign as it sparks a small sense of necessity within your soul. You could confront fears and nightmares alike and resist death for a while longer. Branches fall from pig perches, crashing and colliding on their way. You need no time in deciding future nightmares. You see the soul of the weary monster in our face and you feel empathy. The beast releases a mighty, roar, a mighty roar, showering the sky with tearful exasperation. This malicious exhibition flares the forest around you into nothing short of an overwhelming tempest. Trees tear from deepest roots, mud and rock crashes, the forest utterly ravaged. I'll quake before this creature. Save one. You. Instead of withdrawing, you step forward. No. The tempest begins to recede as the beast peers at you, no longer thundering. No more. The beast is initially shocked and prepares to reverberate, yet something prevents it. Grasping its chest in a grimace as words are a flaming spear, the shrieking figure plunges into pain. No more. No more, you repeat. The beast screams and cries in agony as fire spills from weeping wounds, cursing along the remaining plantation. An inferno rages, uh, an inferno rages yet you stand idle in awe. The salient image of the, of the perturbing and eternal burning is only broken by the, by the unprecedented. The sun. The flaming, celestial body, the flaming celestial body is a miracle from a fantasy. That first ray caressing you, it's passionate and it's fierce. It's soothing yet invigorating. It speaks to you, whispering of past, and de of past endeavors and future victory. But as you stand to the beams of light, you can't help but feel dread. For today, the beast was defeated and the forest escaped. But what of tomorrow? Tomorrow, will you continue to fight and vote? Can you fight and vote? Or will you finally submit to superior oppression? Will the beasts, of beasts and forests of tomorrow subjugate and plunge you to the end? Such trials will fall upon you and you, you alone. I honestly don't know you and what you're capable of. All I know is the beasts and forests I face will forever be present and shall forever burn. between good wine and bad. Had thought by now that I would no longer have to tally up copper, copper nickel-plated coins just to afford holes in my wasted lungs. A stranger passing by yells, why don't you just light a $20 bill on fire and suck back on that? I tell her, the same reason you ornament yourself in cork wedge heels and $60 Sadata Gautama t-shirts. Because sometimes it can be hard, this breathing just for one. Tonight she will fix her legs into a crucifix for the first man who says he would die for her sins. And I, I will walk the fluorescent aisles of an after hours bottle shop, still unenlightened by the disparity between a good drop and a bad. <laughs> Uh, Rebecca is going to write, read some poetry. 
Yeah, we can go in public. Yeah. Sorry. That's good. I don't even have to bring that up. Yeah, we can have some of that. It's probably one of the four directions. So in, uh, it's my first time. in 2010, my family had the opportunity to live in India for a year. And we pretty soon discovered that um, auto rickshaw drivers would often come along and want to take you anywhere, everywhere. One day we were standing um, at the railway station and uh, a driver came by and he introduced himself. He said, the name's Schumacher, Michael Schumacher. <laughs> <laughs> so, this first poem is my tribute to all the budding Schumachers of India who are plying their rather dangerous trade on the city streets. The name's Schumacher, Michael Schumacher. This is our cue to flee, but slow of wit, we climb aboard amiably. Two-stroke engine, guns to life. Coloured lights start to flash on and off across the dash. Doof, doof music turned up loud. Eyes a dazzle, heads a rattle. We surge forth fearlessly into battle. There is no gap he can't find. Schumacher is to trouble born. One hand on the throttle, the other on the horn. A handcart laden with fruit sways our way. A child, innocent, ding on a testosterone wave, blinded by the flashing lights, doof doofing to an early grave. This is it, I'm sure of it. Bus, a lurching, belching bus. We can see it, but I'm certain it can't see us. Grimly, we prepare for impact. Schumacher breaks hard, comes to a halt that is jarring. Then he turns to us with a smile at his charm. Sir, madam, your destination. And the second poem. <laughs> One of the many places that auto rickshaw drivers love to take you is to the emporiums because they often get a kickback. Um, so one way or another, it's quite hard to avoid going to an emporium, and once there, it's even harder to avoid buying something. So this is called the unwitting customer. Traditional handicrafts emporium. A salesman swings open the door. Madam, first lucky customer of the day. <laughs> she steps into the dimness, triggering an enthusiasm which flips a switch, which floodlights a room, which Madam, would you like tea or coffee? Neither. She pinches, backs away. I was just looking. The man nods to a woman behind him who nods to a woman behind her who nods. A cup of sweet, milky tea arrives. Now, madam, how can we help you? Tell me. Madam sits down her cup. My husband is wet. Oh, the man's ecstatic. Your husband! A shirt, maybe. He lifts shirts from the shelf. Madam, would you like one or two? None. One? But what about your son, of whom you are very proud? <laughs> I don't have a son. Oh, madam, very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> your father. You must be buying one for your father who raised you. My father's dead. Madam, so very, very sorry. There are no words. Not even one the man shakes his head. Something then for your poor, poor mother. Embroidered shawls appear. The man is joyous. Pure. One hundred percent warm. Feel. Madam, it's great to have some new people here tonight and it's always a bit daunting, I think, when um, people come to a place that haven't been and actually get up in front of people. So well done to the newbies tonight. Yeah. Uh, Jeannie. Jeannie's going to read a non-fiction piece called For Henry. Oh.
This is an Anzac piece, so I'm going to get It is a still night, cold and dark. From the distance, the orange glow of the fire barrels could be seen. Sparks shot up and danced as high as 10 metres in the air. The crowds gathered round, absorbing the radiant heat to keep out the chill. A voice over the loudspeaker attracted attention. The masses moved reluctantly from the warmth across the road to the memorial. It was impossible to tell how many. There was silence as the cattle folk party marched along their path. Their steps so measured that they sounded as only one pair of boots treading the ground. Instructions at a whisper carried across the still air. They took their places at the four corners, turned outwards, rested their guns, and bowed their heads in silent mourning. A single shot broke through the trees and then another, to be replaced by several short bursts of machine gun fire. The light from the automatic weapons gave a lady position amongst the trees. In those few seconds in the pre-dawn of April 25th, it was easy to imagine how many unsuspecting soldiers were cut down on the shores of Gallipoli before they knew what had happened. The Anzac service at the Simpson Barracks had begun, and we remember. When we stand in silence and remember the sacrifices of past wars, I think of Henry. I knew nothing of Henry shipped out. March 1916 found him in France, where he made and sent home a present for Mother's Day from her loving son, a hand in Verona Carter's son. He had the most beautiful handwriting, indicating a time when such things were important. By August 5th, he was dead. The official letter from the War Office was addressed to his father only. Mothers had no significance in those days. A report from his commanding officer and a witness who was with him. They were in the front trench at Pozieres when the battalion was relieved and encountered heavy shelling on the way to Sausage Gully where they would spend the night. Two hours later, when the battalion regrouped, he was gone. Can a father find solace in the words of praise written on paper? Does the cold metal of the service medal replace the warm flesh and blood of the mother's only son? Do young girls not mourn their brother? I knew one of Henry's sisters. She was my great-grandmother. And I can't begin to imagine how she felt when her only son, also named Henry, went off to war in 1940. Luckily, he returned. Henry's not the only relative I've lost, but he's the one I know the most about. He's as real to me now as anyone I know. That's included in Daniel Council's Anzac exhibition called Recollections. The exhibition opens next Monday and runs for six weeks down at the Hatching Open Home. If anybody's at all slightly interested, go down there and check out. It's going to be a great exhibition. Cool.
having the exhibition at the Banyo, I'm still involved in the Banyo in one of the cultural groups, but that art space before was called the Hanch, was called the Amenai. I was my exhibiting gallery, I exhibited there for 10 years straight, until one day I stumbled across BC Bird, three years ago, and that was the end of me. Good end. Anyway, um, 13 years ago, <coughs> I was in the, in the islands, in fact, I was in one of the, well, just having this huge party, they had a cake for 200 people in, for me because I'd come back and they had the brass band that picked me up at the, at, at the port and uh, they had this cake of about 400 people. And, you know, and it's, the, the, the moonlight there is incredible. In fact, at, at the bottom corner, you see there's a religious duty, but you can see the moon in the back and the sky is almost if it was daylight. And you get that eerie feeling. You know, so I come up with this little poem, and it's called To You, O Muse. I bought a ray of sunshine for you, but the moon, as jealous as ever, would not let me to take it, would not let it take it away with me. So I live in a room of darkness, searching in vain for you, wondering if it did happen, if ever it was true. So I bought a ray of sunshine. I bought it only for us. And the moon smiling at me saying, Stupid! Yes, it was true. <laughs> now, this is a strange little story. It's called uh, Secret Lovers Jeringong. Jeringong is a little place in an uh, in New South Wales coast in the south. And in the early 60s, I went to a, a group from the left that uh, we just sort of had uh, formed the, the CND in Australia Council of the Nuclear Disarmament. It had formed in England. One of the founders was Harold Wilson, later on became uh, Prime Minister of England. And um, so I used to go there every year. Camping, and it was great because we had people from a lot of Australia and uh, all young you know, university students, apprentices, plumbers, every, we were self sufficient. But we never came that time, so the, the local people, the farmers, weren't too happy about us going there. But anyway, it's another story. At the same time, something was happening in Canada because the American draft dodgers didn't want to go to Vietnam. They hopped across. From Mancula, he, he was a, a deputy uh, prime minister of Australia. Was the only, so I'm talking my time. The, the only treasurer who never presented a budget. And uh, he, I think he's, he was one of the first news that really sort of that it might not bounce about it. But he, he died. And then no longer ago, also one of their friends, Tommy Wren, passed away. He was also a Labour minister, Tommy Wren from Queensland. He was one of their, one of their friends. He was like the patron. Anyway, so it's anonymous lovers at Jerry Gong Beach. Their paths crossed one afternoon on a secluded Jerry Gong Beach. The moon and stars shining bright. Together they shared the night. That my passionate love from dark to light in the shed that he built. And Dory wrecked the naked bodies with a well worn army blanket, as she had done with others before. <coughs> she threw it on the golden sand as they ran to the ocean waters to purify the flesh. The wise were cold, the young bodies burning with desire, the perfect alchemy for the anonymous lovers. She laughed and said, I must go now. He put his arms around her, pressing on the erect breasts, and kissed her sanctuous lips. One more time he wrapped the blanket around him. She shouted with joy, I want to stay here forever. Happily started running back to the hut to build the breakfast fire. 
Like a nymph, she thread lightly the soft, wet sand, going the opposite way. Her long, dark hair flowing in the wind, whistling like the Aeolian flute. On the horizon appeared a young man, wrapped in a shining, bright, new red blanket. Now the shack is a very cold place for the lonely young men. They did not know her name. Actually, it's not a flute, but it's a musical instrument that in the old days, in prehistoric days, they would put, it's like a frame with the four metal strings and the wind makes its sort of sound, makes the sound. It's called the, it was one of the earliest string, in, actually, the earliest string instrument. Four string. So, uh, but the wind. It's like when you've got a flowing hair blown on black, but it's, you know, in the winds, almost seeds. And so that's why the Aeolian flute, it's like the Aeolian flute with all the strings right up over there. I don't have the flowing hair anymore. <laughs> I'll have shortly. Why are you put them away? Got anything exciting happening they want to tell us about? Anyone bringing out a book, doing an exhibition, anything like that? Okay, cool. Um, that's a very thing. Um, Melissa, can you put the stubs into a hat or something so we can avoid them? Yeah, I'm going to buy a ticket. You're going to buy a ticket? Yeah. You want your money in the t shirt. Who <laughs> doesn't want to win a t shirt? <laughs> oh, good. Something that's happening later in the year too, where um, How much is it Les and I will be running a weekend at Hocken Lake, which is for people who are writing <coughs> memoir or life stories or even if they're writing a story about someone in their family. So it's uh, really about um, how, how to get that story out without giving everyone every single bit of detail and making it a bit interesting. So keep your eyes out for that. It's going to be a fun weekend. Has everyone got their tickets ready? Yeah. Have you got a ticket yet, Phil? Yeah. Yeah, we're right. Yeah. Have we got the second one to put in there? It's already in there. It's in there. It's in there. It's in there. Done that. Ready to go? Yeah. He's going to do the number. Okay,